Okay, so that looks good. All right, and then uh, let's see. All right, we're good to go. We're up on. We're live on Twitch too. All right, cool. All right, Dan, I'm going to count you down when, whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Right, anytime now. All right, Dan was born ready. I know that. All right, here we go. <laughs> count you down. Three, two, one. Welcome to episode number 17 of The Grace Stage, the book by Greg Fernandez, Jr. Uh, this is the 17th episode. Today we'll be covering chapter 9 of the book. Chapter 9 of the book is called Suspicious Activity. And we'll be covering, if you're following along at home in the book, pages 74, 75 through 77. And with us today is Greg Fernandez, Jr., William Rail, Stephen Sanziri, Catherine, Michelle, and myself. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Hey, how you doing, guys? Thank you. Well, we've got an interesting chapter today on today's episode. We also have some good, uh, good images and graphics to go along with this podcast for for today and this is uh once again every chapter of greg's book i think is important uh we can't discount any of the chapters um all of them are good and all of them have uh, great detail uh, and they present only facts but uh this, this chapter should be interesting suspicious activity this is one of my one of my favorites uh, should we start off uh, greg yeah please do all right so let's start, and then we'll go through a couple paragraphs here, and then get get everyone's input. I'll start off by reading. Detective Brian Bone spoke with quote friend of the family unquote Chris Klein at 5 p.m. on February 17, 2015. He says I had been trying to locate Klein. Detective Bone wrote in supplemental report quote to learn why he had been at the Crawley residence on 1:19:15 as a neighbor had called in about a suspicious person in the house, unquote. During the call, Klein asked the detective about the status of the investigation and speculated, quote, about how many rounds had been discharged at the house, unquote. He indicated to me, Detective Bone continued, that he had been in the house since the discovery of the Crowley family at the residence. He had said, he had been in there with David's father and brother, had been there with two, and seen there were two shot rounds on the floor and roof. Prior to this conversation, I was not aware of a round being shot into the ceiling slash roof, end quote. I'll end there. There's a lots, of, lots of information there. What I'll just start off for, for the listeners, uh, Greg, is to say that you know, the bodies were discovered in January, on 7th, the 17th of January, 2015, of the three bodies of the Crowley family members. This whole section here takes place on February 17th, 2015. So we've got to keep in mind that a whole month had passed before this conversation even took place. And, and, the, and the quote that's most alarming is Detective Bone saying that I was not aware of a round being shot into the ceiling slash roof. This is, guys, this is one month later, and this is the detective on the case. Um, what are your thoughts to start off with? Uh, I'm going to start with William, maybe, or, or Catherine? Uh, what would sure. you like? <laughs> go, William. Yeah, William. Oh, no, no, no. Ladies William. first, ladies first, ladies first. Let's go, Catherine. Let's <laughs> see what your think, th thoughts are here on this uh, whole Chris Klein episode. Oh, this this is one of my um, – it's like one of those things that just really frustrates you because um, this tells me so much. I mean, we know that Chris Klein is not telling the truth, so why is he not telling the truth? And the other point of contention for me is where Bone is stating he wasn't aware of a – hole in the ceiling and yet to this day they're trying to tell us they knew there was a hole in the ceiling mm -hmm. well no your report clearly tells us no so why are you telling us yes now and who is this Chris Klein why and yeah why was he there and then why was he not able to be found for an entire month how about you William 
Uh, so, I mean, I, a lot of the, the same points I, I'm definitely seeing as well. Um, we know that he, like, uh, just to touch on what Catherine said about out of lie, you know, we know that um, if, we'll get to it later, I'm sure, but um, we know that he directly lied about who was there with him. Um, Dan Jr. seems to be the only one that actually does kind of fit in with this because we see a couple of people actually talking about Dan Jr. being there, but we know Dan Sr. was not there. Um and then that kind of that struck a chord with me, but also the fact that, I mean, how could they not tell there was a bullet hole in the ceiling? I mean, they're saying David shot himself in the head. Where is the bullet? Well, you'd figure they'd look around. Are there bullet holes? And they didn't see the one in the ceiling? That that just strikes me as odd. And I think just to add, this is Dan again, just to add the, as far as an investigation, uh, that would be the most important bullet at the scene would be that suicide mm-hmm. kill shot. Uh, the other ones are important from an investi- you know, for the investigation, but you need to have that final gunshot bullet fragment from the suicide. They never had it for a month, didn't even know there was a hole in the ceiling, which m- many people believe that there wasn't, which is more than likely I believe the truth, that there wasn't at the time. But they've gone a full month, and this is the first time it even raises the antenna of the investigators. And Chris Klein, as is, is, is major he is in this case, this was the very first time investigators spoke with him on the record. There's no visits to his house, mm-hmm. no phone calls until a month later. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm mm. not laughing because it's funny. This is a, this is a, what I would call a triple homicide case, biggest case in the city of Apple Valley for decades. Mm-hmm. And this is the first time they talked to him is one full month later. And this isn't even a joke. This is, this is the facts. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, uh, well, well, I, Stephen, I was, from a, was, from a law was, enforcement uh, background? There was one other thing I wanted to add real quick, just, just oh, to yeah. touch on. So the other thing is he also was talking about how many shots were fired. Why was he curious about that? That's, that's the question I have. Is it well, that's, that's a very good question. I think Stephen could answer that, too, because when, when people mm-hmm. are starting to question, uh, you know, on a normal phone call like this, uh, starting to get what I would call uh, chatty with the detectives, hey, yeah. you know, what do you think? They're, they're inquiring how many shots were fired. Why? Is, that's a very good question. Why did he have to ask that question at all? Why would anyone questioned by police start turning around well, and you know, to question them? Oh, that's yeah, I mean, question, I yeah, I mean, people, people that say too much usually got to look toward the toward the, the meter, meter meter goes toward the guilt side a little bit. Um, and it, it, it you know, varies with different people and it, it, even nationalities. They taught us in the academy. But with Americans, just like us, everything else, you know, like we, we spoke about earlier, the loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room. And if, if it's very quiet, you know, they'll come out and they'll start asking questions or what have you. And then that, that, that leads to, the, you know, you, you know, you want to, if this guy's chatty, you want to talk to him. Greg, any follow up on that? Yeah, I got a few things there. Yeah, I think that's definitely it. Um, he definitely was chatty because that if you if you read detective brian bones report that's what it basically sounds like it's like um you know it doesn't sound like brian bone was asking him questions it sounds like chris klein started asking detective right. questions that's what happens yeah that's yeah i mean that, that 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 i've seen it be i mean it usually is, it's like a 90 percent meter guys if they're like that you know let, you know just there's some guilt it also kind of seems like Klein didn't know that the police didn't know that there mm-hmm. was a bullet hole in that ceiling, um, mm-hmm. because he's just saying, "Hey, we found, you know, we saw these shot, these shot rounds in the floor and in the roof." Um, so at this point, we don't know if Klein did or didn't know that the police even knew about this bullet hole, right? Mm-hmm. There's a few other things here. Um, uh, obviously, the big one, which is really dumb, but it was the big one that really um, – I spent a lot of time in my book trying to figure this out. Maybe, Stephen, maybe you can help me with this. In two re- reports, they spell Chris Klein's name three different, uh, three different spellings. So in, in my book, I ran with the spelling K-L-I-E-N. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right one. I mean, how does – Detective Brian Bone, when he's listing the person's name, his number, his address, date of birth, his age, blah, 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 it's K-L-E-I-N. 
my first thought was, okay, well then that should be the one that I should put. In. Right. That's what I should put in the book. <laughs> but in in his statement, every time that he talks about Klein, it's K L I E N. So I just said, okay, you know what? Okay, I'm just going to put K L I E N. Not that big of a deal for some people. It looks like this. Oh hey. Well, first of all, I, I, I before E after C and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, it's just German. And, well, I can tell you this. The case I'm working right now, the murder case, uh, the first contact after the man was attacked by the dog, uh, Air, Air Ambulance wrote his name is Brandon Katsaros. His name is Daniel Katsaros. Brandon is not even close to Daniel. I, I'll tell you right now, at, at, part of it, I'll tell you, is part of the generation is uh, in police reports and such. If you make a mistake or a date in court, you lose a case and this and that. Uh, a lot of it's just it's it's, just, it's poor penmanship, guys, on, uh, and pay, not paying attention. And I, I would attribute it to that uh, in in lieu of uh, them hi- hiding something. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. I mean, but that's what, what I, I also yeah. Should should we go with uh, the K L I E N because that's what's in the statement and that's in here three, four, five times, or um, you know, is it K L E I N? Now the other report. Detective Sean. Go with, the, go, with, go, with, go with the death certificate. Go with the death certificate. Well, we don't have... <laughs> no, I'm I shouldn't have said that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I, I take that back. The birth certificate. There you go. Uh, well, okay, I can go with that. No, I, no, I mean, something official with him is if you can find something with him, yeah. Right. But anyway, um, I, that, that, it, yeah, we, the, the point is we know who he is. Yeah, yeah, and... and uh, Again, yeah. it's like I spent a lot of time on that, which is not a big deal. It's not may not even be relevant to this case. It just kind of showed how quickly all of this this happened. That they had to get all of this out. This is all new new sure. found stuff for them at this point. Uh, oh, sure. Is, is I don't know if it's if you would qualify it as being reopened, reexamined, et cetera, et cetera. What are the are the levels of that? Um, it is interesting that it took them one month to finally follow up. I had spoken with Catherine, and she she was right um, that it was actually uh, now the the cops left a card. So Detective Bone left his business card for Chris for Chris Klein, uh, but Chris Klein was the one who did call them. They did not call him. So I just right. I know that. Um, that, that, that that's a, that's important, Greg. That's a very important. Uh, I mean, who who calls the police? Nobody wants to talk to the police. Well, if they tell him, right, they they left a re- he he left his card. Yeah, I mean that could be more proof of he's just a a talker. They left a business card, so obviously he wasn't there when the police showed up at Klein's house. And there's it's not really clear, you know, when did they leave the business card as opposed to when Klein called them. Was it the called back day? right the next week? We can all you know we exactly. can say it was sometime between January nineteenth. And February seventeenth of twenty fifteen. That's what we know for yeah. sure. Um, there you go. So when they when they did that, the other thing that I that I uh, had a question was was this the only nine one one call that is tied with this case after as of January January nineteenth? Because there's no other record of any other call of anything like that, and we know that there were people in the house, uh, friends and family of David and Kamel were in that house after January, January, uh, January 19th. So no other neighbor, the neighbor called the police called on January 19th, didn't call any time after that. And that made, made me wonder if there was some connection with the neighbor who called Mm -hmm. and the neighbor was told, Hey, you know, there's going to be people there. You don't have to worry about calling back, you know, don't worry about a quote unquote suspicious person as of January 19th, because there will be other people there. Sure. But this must have been, you know, suspicious in nature enough to warrant that phone call. This this neighbor, I think we lives two, two or three houses down. It's not an immediate neighbor, but it was enough commotion going on there that, that he or she called, and this was a 911 phone call. It doesn't say it here in the report. Uh, but when I submitted for the report for your request for this phone call, it came up as a 911 call through dispatch on the 19th. So someone made a 911 um, fairly urgent call, I, I would suspect, uh, at, at the location of a triple homicide uh, where bodies were discovered two days before. That's a, this is a pretty major event, I would think, enough so that he or she didn't even leave their name. 
Right. But we haven't gotten to that point, I don't think, yet. But uh, it's very interesting, yes. I'm a little curious as to why they didn't leave their name. I don't know. Uh, I don't think any of us know the answer to that. But um, yeah, Did the police ask. Did they ask yeah. for the neighbor's name? I don't even think that's in the report, right? No, no. Mm-hmm. And it's you know what, crazy. guys? The, the ch- chances are police dispatch has a phone number that came in. They're just not disclosing it. Yeah. Yeah, but they, 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 got, they, have, they, they know who's they know who's calling. Yes. They gave us ninety four pages and put everybody's phone number in there. I, I took the phone numbers out. <laughs> you know, it took me a, a little while. Yeah. I didn't have the software that maybe William has to take them out and find <laughs> I had to literally go through page by page to take really? every person's phone number out. Um so anyways. Wow. <laughs> All right, unless there's anything else, we can move on to the next page. All right, on the, um, this is on the top of page 75 in the book. It says, the following day, February 18th, Detective Bone relayed the new information to Detective Sean McKnight. He says, quote, I contacted Daniel Theodore Crowley, Detective McKnight wrote in his report, the father of David Crowley. To our knowledge, he is the next of kin in this case. He told me, he was not, um, you know, not aware of the bullet hole, and had not go into the house with Klein. I asked for permission from Dan Senior to enter the home to verify that there is a bullet hole. He agreed to let us in and provided us with the lockbox code. Code end quote. Should we stop there or continue on? Yeah, yeah let's stop there. Get everybody. Stopped. Okay. So we know. Also, started off here. We know that. Chris Klein said to police in his direct words that I was in the house with David's brother and his father. So they make a call to the father just to follow up. You know, they're vetting the conversation, following up. Were you in the house with this character called Chris Klein? And the father says, no, I wasn't. Well, this this should already have the antenna of the uh, detectives, you know, antenna raised by, by this. And then they go on to say that uh, he's the next of kin, which I think at this point was the father and his mother, David Crowley's mother, Kate, I think would also be next of kin, right? Is that correct? I'm surprised they say just the father here, but his parents were divorced uh, at both at this time, both still alive. Wouldn't both be the next of uh, kin or, or did they come to any conclusion there with the father? Um, and then they just asked for permission to enter the house and he says, yes, go in and, and take a check, uh, check it out. Here's the code. He lives in a uh, town called Owatonna, which is about a 45-minute drive away from Apple Valley. So that would make sense that he just said, go on in there yourself and, and, and check it out. I'm not going to drive up there just to look. But here's the key code. Go on in for the, for the combination. And so that was very interesting. Didn't came Once again, this is a month, this is a month later. The, the memorials, the cremations, everything had already been done. And we're, they're still getting these odd conversations from strange characters in this, uh, strange actors, I should say, uh, in this case. Anyone else? I mean, I think everything was already pretty much touched on, but yeah, I think you definitely make some really good points here. That I mean, it's it's a month later. Why why didn't they find all this stuff prior? It doesn't make any sense. And I'm still curious as to why this didn't raise uh, the attention of any of the detectives on this. Is the well, maybe we should look into this guy further. Maybe we should be looking at some of these other actors here. A little bit more closely. It's kind of Do you me. think? Um, and I'm, this is a, a, a question directed for Stephen Sanziri as uh, someone formerly in law enforcement. Is do they have the audio of this conversation where they called the father? Uh, and is that something that we could, as a FOIA request, request to get the audio of how this conversation went? Uh, I'm I'm willing to bet the father, Daniel Crowley, uh, David's father, probably says. Wait, wait, who, who's Chris Klein, and why would he say I was in the house? Who, who's this guy? Or did he say, oh, yeah, I know, I know him. Uh, I wasn't in the house with him, but I know him. I'd like to know what his response would be. Is that something that's possible, Stephen? Yeah, I, I think it is. All, all conversations in the police departments, and I can't tell you everywhere until which years they, they arranged it and, and adapted that anybody who called in or anything else was recorded. Um, and 
uh, now there'll be something where, you know, they'll let you know that. But I think there was a time when Title Title 14 wasn't involved in that. Uh, in case somebody, like, dialed the wrong number of 911 or something and, and it was an emergency, they could, they could at least record it and, re, and rehear it, what have you. So that, that came around with that. But I'm not sure. Uh, I can't answer that exactly. If you can obtain it or if there is even a recording of that, I, I really don't know. Right, because this um, this this would be the yeah. police calling uh, David's father, right? Yeah. So it would be the other way around. Um, you know what? They'd have to let him know, but I don't know if they re- would record it. I really don't know, Greg. And I would think the one way to get about that, work around that, would be to submit the FOIA, and if, if they write back and say this doesn't exist, then we have our answer that they sure. weren't recording. Or if they say it does exist, but you don't have rights to it or, or something, or it's long since been you know, deleted, we'll still have the answer as far as that, too. But I would think all these things would be recorded. Yeah, I know 911 is recorded because we've subpoenaed those all day, but I don't know if I've sub- subpoenaed anything that was a normal. But that the PD called them, yeah, probably they'd recorded it. I would get, maybe that I wouldn't. And, and just piggybacking off of that, I'd be very interested in that Chris Klein conversation with Detective Bone to see how that went. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would for sure be, be on record, would it not? Um, yeah, I mean, it, but you know, just like the Yosemite case, when they interviewed one of the main suspects, they forgot to turn on the, the camera. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know. There should be something there. Yeah, you should, you know, it's going to be recorded and they, 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 they talk or they don't talk. And yeah, other, you know, no, nobody sits down without recording something. There's no way because it's hearsay from there. It's your word against his. I mean, video or audio, but video is best with audio. Yeah, and this isn't, the, you know, Stone Age. Yeah, they should have that. And at this point in time, um, it's just, just quickly, at the beginning of this case, it didn't, this case did not draw that much attention uh, the first three or four uh, days into this case uh, on social media because of the justice pages, it started to pick up. But we had 25, maybe 30 members uh, on the page. But now a month later, by this time on February 16th, uh, this was drawing considerable attention uh, nationwide and everything else. And, you know, Judy Prochnow had since entered the fray on our page, uh, effective February 14th. She started posting. So this was 17th and 18th of February when they knew that Hey, this is drawing a lot of backlash. This entire case. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would suspect something as as minor as oh, I forgot to turn on the recorder probably wouldn't have happened back then. But they would have had their senses heightened, I think, or you know, um, by by doing everything, taking every precaution they could by this point. Unless you said uh, like before, uh, if there was a cover up, then we would we would know that. Um, well, well, Dan, Dan, Dan there's a, there's. Dan, there's a, there's a cover-up because when I was doing the Yosemite case in 1999, and it's in the papers, as that Stanislaus County investigators forgot to turn the recording camera on. Uh, with, with Eugene Dykes, who was the number one or two suspect originally. I yeah. mean, so, yeah, it can happen 15 years later. Yeah. 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 It's a, this, okay. case is, this case is this case is a, is a is foobar, you know? Yeah. That's it. Okay, interesting. Well, we're just Anyone trying else? to prove We're just trying to... We're just trying to prove it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's it. That's the bottom line. Yeah, I've got I've got a few points here, um, uh, or a few things. Now that you bring it up, now I'm wondering why they would call David uh, or Dan Crowley Sr. the next of kin when obviously, you know, his his mother is there too. So how do they decide that? Is it always the father? Is that just the general way of how that process goes? Um, Going back and forth, of obviously we know either Chris Klein is telling the truth or Dan Crowley Sr. is. I believe it's impossible for both of them to be telling the truth about who, if Dan Sr. was there. That's the real question. Two questions. Was Dan Sr. there in the house, and did Dan Sr. see that bullet hole? If Klein was in the house on January 19th, which he, he said that he, he was, and he said that he was with Dan Crowley Sr. Klein also says that Klein saw the bullet hole. If Dan Crowley Sr. was there in the house with, with Klein, I think he would have seen that bullet hole too. And this is why I tend to believe Dan Crowley Sr. over Chris Klein. Uh, just looking at the documents, the very little documentation that we do have here is because um, Dan Sr. didn't know wasn't in the house and he didn't know about this. It's just, it's too, it's like, 
it's like a parallel world here. Klein is in one world, Dan Sr. is in a, another world, and it's just like, it's pretty fascinating. Um, but the fact is, only one of them can be right. The police don't follow... Right. Yeah, who, who, yeah who, is, who, is, who has the motivation of lying? Not the father. Father didn't have nothing to do with his son's death. So the other guy's lying. That's it. You know, the other thing, too, guys is uh, ha- have someone in your house take a pencil and just draw a little, you know, five-eighth circle in the ceiling with a pencil, walk in and just look around. I bet you'll catch your eye. The bullet hole, was, that, was, that was noticeable. It was done afterwards oh, or, or what ha- whatever, you know. Yeah, it's noticeable. You look, see eight-foot ceiling, look up, you'll see you know, that with the lights on. Absolutely, absolutely 100%. Yeah, so, because, you know, de- I'm sorry to interrupt, because Detective Bones, ahead specifically states that it was a quote-unquote obvious defect as soon as he exactly. opened the door. So if it's yeah. obvious on that day, it's going to be obvious if it were there to begin with. Yeah, just look, I'm, I'm just walking around the house now, just kind of looking at the cabinets, and I, I would have noticed that in a second. Yeah, you're right, Catherine. And then wouldn't, wouldn't it be... I mean, I can understand why the police don't go back to Klein to get a full statement right then, right there. But at some point later on, wouldn't they want to get a, a full statement from Chris Klein about what he was doing in the in the house, what he saw, et cetera, et cetera? Wouldn't shouldn't there be some type of statement as part of these police reports? Because it's not here. Well, we don't even know if they did a follow up with Klein at all. Right. We already know that he was probably more likely lying, and the story didn't match up. So there must have been a follow-up by detectives, but I don't see evidence to support that there was any follow-up at all. Gummert, Gummert said that he did, they they did not follow up with either with either or uh, about that about who was in the house, who was not in the house. So that's there. That's well, my question is, is why would he say that he was there with the father and the son? Um, I mean, especially, I know we're getting into it later, and I don't want to go and spoil too much, but, you know, we're, we're definitely going to be seeing some contradictory statements uh, later. But it's, uh, on top of that, we also know that um, that day, on the 19th, um, I think it was Detective Bone and McKnight also went up to um, Owatonna to go and um, actually sit down with Dan Sr., Dan Jr., and Allison to discuss the timeline. And the thing is that I found it really odd is, we don't have the exact time when they were even kind of a, a general kind of uh, it was around this time or anything. We don't have that for the time that they went to go and check out the hole. We don't have the time when they uh, contacted Chris Klein. We don't have the time um, when uh, actually maybe maybe we do for Chris Klein on the contact. But um, I know we don't have the exact time. So I went over this multiple times this morning. I couldn't find a time where they actually said, oh, yeah, we, we sat down with the, the Crowley family at this time. That he was saying there was no time at all. I, I find that a little odd. Is I mean they're pretty consistent with having a time frame or at least kind of a it's around this time, you know, <laughs> throughout the rest of the case. But these two areas are completely just nothing. We just so, did it this day. That was it. Oh, okay. So they just say the a day. That's mm-hmm. basically it. Because I think they meet with David's mom later that same day. Exactly. They, and it's kind of interesting, I know it's way off topic, but both of the parents that they meet with, um, they don't meet with them separately. You know, it's always with one or two of their of their kids. Yeah. Well, and there like, are times, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dan, go ahead. I'll just do a quick one. It relates to you, Catherine, your statement. Um, the detective, after they got almost, you know, uh, pe- people started assuming that they didn't do their job by not noticing the defect in the ceiling. When quoted, the detective said later there was an obvious defect in the ceiling. And I think from a police or law enforcement person, it's not likely to be using adjectives like that when when asked a question. They would just say, yes, we saw the defect. We saw or we witnessed the hole in the ceiling. He goes out of his way to use the word obvious Mm -hmm. as as a way to prove that they did not do anything wrong the first time they were there. They were drawing considerable... Uh, slack, some flack for, for possibly missing the hole the first time they were there. So that's, I think, why he went out of his way to use the word obvious, while at the same time it backfires and puts Gummert in a 
Frenny's position because now they're basically saying that they didn't notice it the first time. Uh, so I think that's why he used the word obvious, uh, which I, I don't think uh, the rest of the, the police department there liked because now it put them in a position to say, how do you, you know, obviously miss it the first time. That's why they had to come back and say, no, no, we didn't miss it. We saw it both times. And that's where Greg <laughs> got them all cornered by saying, then show us the evidence of the photo that you took on January 17th, and they couldn't provide it. So I think the the answer, mm -hmm. number one, by whoever said the ceiling defect was there with using the word obvious, backed them all into a corner, painted them into the corner, and then Greg Fernandez, I believe, did a great job on, on just saying, well, then provide us with a photo that shows that you did see it there on January 17th, uh, the day that bodies were discovered, and they have yet to do that six years later. So that's a key important part. Uh, but I think he exposed himself by saying the word obvious because he didn't want to look bad for, you know, obviously missing it the first time. But what we have proven since this in the past six years is that there was no hole there the first day. The hole was added later. So now we've got people altering a crime scene. Go ahead, Catherine. Sorry. Uh, no, that, that's fine. Um, and kind of what... Um, kind of what uh, see, oh my gosh, I, so many things going through my head. But how I... I'll jump to this point that you made first, um, is that I see him using the terminology not so much as um, I'm going to cover my butt. I see it as he's writing a report because if I remember correctly, in the initial reports written, Bone is the one who's extremely detailed in all of his writing. I mean, you look at his statement and then you compare it to the others. I mean, his is, it's like... Wow, a dream come true. This, 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 this. I mean, he was like right on the money, but never once mentioned a hole in the ceiling. So now yeah, but, yeah. Going... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Well, I, I'm sorry. When, when he wrote the word obvious, it's obvious upon what is new, not obvious upon what was before. So if we looked up there, we would say it's obvious too. That, that's his, his opinion at that time. So that mm -hmm. puts it into that obviously happened afterwards. It's, if it's obvious, he's saying it's obvious. Yeah, if I walked in, it's obvious. A month before, it wasn't. So that, 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 that there just puts it right in that position, Catherine. Exactly, and that's where I was getting to, is that when, then yeah. when he states that in his next report, that to me mm -hmm. is he's saying, well, obviously, we didn't catch it the yeah. first time, but here it is. And it's right yeah. there in plain sight. Yeah. And um, so, But also at the same time, I really don't think that they thought – the likes of Dan Hennon and Greg Fernandez Jr. were going to grab hold of this case and just mm -hmm. tear it apart and blow it wide open. Oh, sure. So sure. if they had even remotely thought that, I kind of wonder what the reports would look like to begin with. I think mm -hmm. I think they would be different. Absolutely. But oh, oh, here was my other thought. Um, so it just came back to me. Sorry, um, but. Do we know um, when the cleaning crew finished with the house? 24th. Was that, oh, on the 24th? Yep. Okay. So, okay, because I was wondering why Klein had mentioned the hole in the floor and the ceiling and then why the hole in the floor was never followed up on, but okay. they didn't finish till the 24th. Now that makes sense. Okay, Catherine, let me uh -huh. ask you something. Yes. We know, we know, we know the bolt in the ceiling is, is, is post post homicide okay correct correct why was that we, we, i think greg tried to answer why they didn't hear another a shot or a bullet hole or anything else the hole in the ceiling is you know are we so are we positive that that just wasn't poked through or something that looked like it do we know that for sure that was it with the bullet fragments found up in there did they pull those out we have pictures of that uh, yes, they do have pictures yep. of the fragment up in the attic, and when you look okay. at the, and, and I don't know enough about um, bullet holes and entries, but when you look at the initial hole before Joe Cooksley decides to put his finger up in there and, and make it bigger, right. Um, right. it does look like uh, a bullet could have been shot through there because you see kind of a, an indentation, rounded yeah. indentation before the, the big hole appears. Right. So, okay, and that's perfect. And so why did they do that? What was the reason to do that afterwards? That makes it look sloppier. Uh, be, well, my my thought is is that somebody figured out they didn't have the right number of bullets. They didn't have, you know, they 
uh oh, where's David? They have these others. We know that that went to Kamel and Rania, and we know that one was in the floor. This one was, you know, just ejected or dropped. Oops, mm -hmm. where's David's bullet? Yeah, okay. That's my thought, and and it could be totally wrong, but... Yeah, no, I, I, I don't... <laughs> Yeah, there were there were people in and out of that house. Not in and out, but there were people who would leave stuff at the front door stoop of David's house. Um, probably starting January seventeenth, maybe starting on the nineteenth or so. But it's just kind of weird that this is the only quote unquote suspicious activity call that is mentioned that we know yeah. of. Maybe there's more that we just don't know know about. Um, but it's just like what makes. I think you guys brought up a good point. What makes this one different from anyone else? Um, that would have just been dropping off stuff at the house because there was when the cops show up there there were things in front of of that house but I guess maybe what made it different is that now you have somebody who goes in into the house. Well, okay, it, hey, Greg. Let, let, oh, I am so sorry, Catherine. I'm so no, I'm sorry. I always I have bad timing. But I know I, I know I, I got short thoughts, so I always interrupt. I'm so bad. I get something on my mind. I want to say it. I know. I I'm think the we same all do that. Ah. <laughs> But, you know, I was, I was, you know, this to me shows that is Chris Klein lying yet one more time? It's possible. I'm not saying he's lying. Please don't try to sue me. Well, go ahead, try. I take that back. And try it. But um, because, you know, he states that he saw this on the 19th, if I'm following what you guys and what this is saying correctly, on the 19th of January, he's telling this to Bone on the 17th of February. Now, how can that be true because the cleaning crew would have seen this quote-unquote obvious defect. They didn't document it. They didn't call because when they found the fragment that rolled out from the rug, and to me that's perfectly normal. That makes lots of sense. I know a lot of people go, oh, they missed that. Well, it's, it makes lots, it's hard to often find these and see these, um, these bullet fragments. So the fact that the cleaning crew was rolling something up and as they're moving it, it fell onto the floor. Okay, it makes sense to me. They called, they called, but see, they called it in. That's the point. And yet they, and they're coming in and they're seeing every spot marked. They, they see and they know, but yet not one mention from the cleaning crew about the ceiling. So it couldn't have been there. Up until or, the 24th. Well, yeah, or you okay. also have, because remember, the cops are called back in there. So the cops are back in there on January 20th to exactly. find item 53. They obviously have to look up. There's no obvious defect that anybody sees. So great point. And, and see, that, yeah, yeah, that's my point. It's like up until the 24th, there is no hole in that ceiling. And then magically... Right. Between the 24th and then the the 17th, we'll give right. it that date, even though they didn't show up to the 18th. Somehow that hole now appears. Yeah, and then, you know, an eight foot ceiling is at eye level, guys. We know that. And the second thing is, is that you remember that movie Sunshine Cleaning? Uh -huh. Remember that when the yep. two gals went out and they would clean up crime scenes? Does anybody? I'm not. Have, you, have any of you contacted a company like that and see any kind of protocols or what's the average cleanup on a homicide or triple homicide? Has anybody done that? Because I have no uh, idea it's, I was, how long it takes. I was looking at it. I, I was looking at it last out. night, and it – oh, sorry. You can get the <laughs> uh, Well, no, I was just saying, I reached out to crime scene um, cleaners. They have a YouTube channel, and they also have a okay. Facebook channel. And um, I asked them how thorough that they were, and, and they're mm – -hmm. Um, plus, you, they videotape everything, and so um, oh, okay. you can watch cool. what they do and how they handle the, the scenes that they go in, and they're looking at everything. They, uh, I mean, they're looking up, down, they're spraying, they're, they're chemicals. Right, they're, yeah. They're, they're yeah. very, very thorough, and I have okay. yet to see this, this company miss something and have to go back. Yeah, there you go. I, I thank you for that, I, Catherine. I, I didn't look that up. So I looked at the like the time frame that that most places will generally go, and I started looking from like different company, to different company. I mean, they all they all differ, but they generally it's around the anywhere depending on the size of the crime scene, of course, um, and everything that's affected. It, it can take anywhere between four hours up to I think they said it was like like three or four days. So mm -hmm. once they come in, I mean, it's 
for taking three to four days to do it, I mean, it's got to be a huge crime scene. I mean, with this, I mean, obviously, it took around that time because I believe they started, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they started on, like, I think it was the 20th, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to look into it again, but it's I, I want to say it was around the 20th. So. Yeah, and they appeared to be very thorough. They got everything. You know, they made sure that... Um, when the family did come back into the house, nothing was missed. So I find it extremely difficult to believe that a professional service like that cleaning crew would miss a mm -hmm. bullet hole in the ceiling because that would be so traumatic to a family if they walked mm -hmm. in and saw that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, that yeah. Was, that, was, sure. that was why we tried to contact them. And that was one one of the things that we wanted to know was um, did did you guys did did you see it because obviously any anybody who walks into that house after January 17th they could it's safe I could believe that they would believe that the cops saw that hole so for them seeing the hole isn't nothing big it's just okay there's there's a hole up top there's a hole in the in the ground nothing big nobody knows at this point that the cops have never seen this hole right. So, anyway. Um, yeah. Yep, exactly. All right. Uh, Dan, if you want to continue. Yeah, I'd like to uh, continue on. And just before I continue on, the person that made that call for 911 that we still don't know the name, I'd like uh, – I'm sure a lot of the neighbors are following this case. Uh, feel free to come forward. Uh, you don't have to give your name, address, nothing like that. But it would be interesting to do an interview – either on the record or off the record, as far as what prompted you to make that call, uh, please reach out to us in a direct message or something on that Justice for David Crowley and family page, uh, if, you, if you're willing. It's, it's six years later. It would be interesting to hear the details of what caused that uh, 911 call to be um, called. Right. Oh, Dan, Dan, I wanted to say something uh, along the lines you were talking about now and digressing back a few minutes ago is um, – it's like the Philip Marshall case, and even then we didn't. Greg went up there uh, like uh, Wayne Madsen did, and there was, and you, you guys, there wasn't a lot of um, pineapple express between the neighbors. And them. you know, if there's a triple homicide or three bodies in a little neighborhood like that, everybody's going to know about it in an hour. And there should have been a lot more calls. I mean, I would be looking out my window for, for three weeks if that happened and there was crime scene tape up. I mean, that that's a disturbing thing. So I think there was a lot more that came in that they're not reporting. Okay. Interesting. Activity around the house afterwards, I think, uh, in some ways. But everybody knew about that. I mean, I'd be picking out my curtains. True. You uh, know, just, page, yeah. page 35, Detective Brian Bone and Detective Sean McKnight enter the Crowley house once again at 3 p.m. on Friday, February, I'm sorry, February 18th. Uh, 2015, we immediately found what appeared to be a bullet hole in the ceiling, wrote Detective Bone, quote, near the front door and adjacent to the living room, unquote. The detective also wrote about the possible trajectory of the bullets, speculating the shot must have come from the living room area. Makes sense. In the master bedroom, the detectives found the closet open with the ladder underneath the attic access point. Quote, we looked for an access for access to the attic area of the house, Detective Bowen reported, and found that the attic access from the master bedroom closet was open. This had not been open at the time of our initial search of the home on January 17, 2015. I contacted the BCA crime scene team and advised them of our findings. I requested they assist us in documenting the damage and assist in looking for the bullet in the ceiling attic area. End quote. Should I stop there? Sure. Um, yeah, my, on, my only question about this is, if they didn't open the attic, who did and why? Oh, I got another question. Whose ladder is it then? Because it's uh, not from the Crowley household. I mean, I thoroughly checked. I mean, there is not the ladder from the Crowley household. Oh, like good point. Good point. I didn't know that, William. You looked through the other crime scene photos, and that ladder does not uh, exist. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Pops up nowhere else. Wow. Oh. Well, what would have been your thought That's a valid if point. you walked in? A good point. Uh, Stephen, you hear that question? No, I didn't. Go ahead. 
Oh, I said, what would have been your thought if you were the police officer and walked in and saw that ladder and you knew it was not something your off you or your other officers had done? Oh, I mean, it, it would spark my interest. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, there, there was it's like you guys are going back to. There's just too many people in that house, and I don't know how many detectives and everything. You know, there might have been some crime scene of forensics people in there that, you know, they're in the report and, you know, they didn't do much, but I think there was just too much activity in the house. I would think it's different. Yeah. I mean, I've gone back to crime scenes and, and you know, it's basically, and the other thing too is you usually park a patrol car out there for a few days. Nobody goes in. I don't understand that should have been there for, for the neighborhood. You know, you don't just walk away. Do you fingerprint that ladder? Try to get some DNA. Uh, if it, I mean, if it, uh, that did great. If, well, if it's, is it wood, was it wood or aluminum, guys? I didn't look at it. It looks like it's, it's aluminum. Um, aluminum. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could probably. Yeah, I mean, I would. I would definitely throw some dust on it, and you're gonna get. You are gonna get some prints off. It's aluminum, and uh, it's it's gonna be smooth in some areas. Sure, might as well print it. Yeah, why not? I mean, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. That's all I got on that one. Yeah. It says, uh, going forward, it says, with the house secured, Detective Sean McKnight remained in the driveway while Detective Bowen obtained the search warrant. The search warrant was signed by District Court Judge Sean M. Moynihan at 4.25 p.m. on February 18, 2018. The Minnesota BCA crime scene team, led by Joe Cooksley, arrived at 5 45 p.m. The team consisted of Joe Cooksley, Beth Wolf, Lance Lehman, Agent Chris Olson, and one observer. And it's not clear. So, uh, you know, Joe Cooksley was the one who gets there. Uh, he led the crime scene team for the BCA, the Minnesota BCA. And he's the one who stuck that finger in, in there and ruined the crime scene of, that, of this, the ceiling hole. Is that something that's normal? That seems odd. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. I think so. Cooksley, um, Cooksley was also there on the the seventeenth, and yes, you know, he does a lot of notes, a lot of things. He he writes out a lot of stuff, and I mean, we have uh, we must have at least forty or fifty pages of just his written notes here, and from January seventeenth, no mention of any any bullet hole in the ceiling there were tons of people there's a whole list of people that were in the house on january 17 2015 none of them saw this bullet hole yeah and it is the job of the bca to look for other evidence and they saw nothing documented nothing and it wasn't like you were stating it wasn't just cooksley he had an entire team there on the 17th for hours and nobody documents it that's suspicious activity right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice plug, nice plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving forward, it says, Detective McKnight stated that the bullet hole was, quote, near the entryway in close proximity to where the Christmas tree had been, end quote. He goes on to say, the BCA crime scene team took measurements of the bullet hole and collected the bullet for further examination. Um, quote, during the initial processing of the crime scene, Detective McKnight explained, we knew that we could not account for several bullets that may have been fired from the gun used, end quote. So they, by the time they left on the 17th, the first day, the, the numbers didn't, the math didn't add up, right? And then the last... Um, should I go on with the last paragraph? Are we paused, Greg, or is that just for the video effect? It looks like Greg may have paused it. I'm going to hang tight. Yeah, um, my main screen just went down, but we should still be... Let's see if I can bring this back up. That was weird. Just completely died all of a sudden. Okay, I'm going to try. How about on uh, Twitch, William? Is that okay? Uh, I mean, I, it still says pause on mine. Yeah, I'll probably say pause till I can get this screen sharing going again. Great timing. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> We're on our last paragraph, too. We've got one paragraph to go here, then we can discuss. Uh, this is all very Let interesting. Know. Let me know if this comes back on at any time here. Looks like it's back on. Mm. It says it's sharing. You guys should see it here. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Now it looks good. Okay. Modern technology... All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the joys. There we go. All right. I'll continue on. Is that okay, Greg? Yeah, please Six. continue on. Okay. On February 19th, 2015, AVPD app. Uh, Detective Brian Bone reviewed the original crime scene images. On 2-19-15, Detective Bone reported, I viewed the images taken from the initial search of the house. This would have been on the 17th of January. In viewing these I'm photos, back. I could see the hole in the ceiling, which we discussed on 2-18-15. This is very, a very important paragraph. And also what I would call discrepancies, if not cover-up or some uh, little white lies you're, you're being told. What are your thoughts, everybody? Well, all um, I know is that the photo that they're claiming is the one that shows the bullet hole. This is nothing. I mean, this would be torn apart in a court of law in two seconds flat. It would be thrown out because there are no close-ups. There's nothing to really state, yes, that was a bullet hole. There's a... a slight glare or um, bright spot, if you will, in one of the photos. But is that just reflection coming from the camera? You see other bright spots as well. Why isn't that the bullet hole? So, yeah, I, I just, I don't buy it because they took close-ups of everything else, which is how you're supposed to. You take it from a distance, you move in closer, 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 and then you have, and then you assign it a number, and nothing like that was done. So they're trying to CYA at this point, and to me, they failed yep. miserably. Well, this is the photo. Go ahead. I was just just gonna say this. This is the photo here. Oh, no, I mean I. I, I'm just saying, yeah, no, I agree. This, this, this definitely would be part of our... And like what Catherine said, there would be uh, photographs of different angles, of uh, different distances, all of that same hole, just like we saw with uh, what they took on February 18th. And it would have been assigned a number. It would have been used as evidence. So the statement is a blatant lie, I think. And we get back into this, the law enforcement um, angle, I'll call it, if, of not necessarily going with, a, a cover-up or not, but covering their, their asses enough because the pride of these detectives are so great that they do not, they do not ever want to admit a mistake. It's one of the faults, I think, of law enforcement is once they get an answer to something, they'll never, ever retract it or go back. They will lie, like in this case, to avoid admitting that they made a mistake. But their job as public servants to, the, to society is to get the story right. We're not worried about your pride. We're not worried about your ego. We want you to solve the crime. That's it. But you got that thin blue line uh, that they will do anything again, can, and, and back up each other to never, ever admit that they have made a mistake. And I've seen this in multiple, multiple crimes. And so that th thin blue line does exist. Um, they are out there to... Uh, They'll never, ever admit. Uh, I've done two interviews with a former Minneapolis police officer himself, and he says, the hoops that you will jump through to avoid ever admitting you made a mistake, you'll have gladly have someone else make a statement that corroborates yours, even if both are a lie, to ever avoid getting the black eye of your department for your staff uh, in, a, in a police department. This is how bad this is. And I said, you know, this is not what uh, being a public servant is all about. 
We want you to get it right. We don't care how confident you are, how big your egos are, and how many awards you win. Your job is to solve the crime. So he said, well, no, it's a very different story out there, very different, real life, very are different they, case than what you think they, it is. Are they scared of being sued? Is that what it is, or why not? No, I think it's the ego. I think it's, I think it's the ego. I, they will never admit that they're wrong. I'm, I'm guessing, well, and I'd place a bet here that these Apple Valley police officers here over time, as each and every one of them slowly retire, we're not going to see them come forward as whistleblowers to say, you know what, I worked that case back in 2015, and you know we were wrong on uh, 15 different points. Um, and I'm just coming out now because I don't have an affiliation with the police department just to admit it. These kind of things will never come forward. So that, that's my beef with the whole thing. They're very, it's a very proud group. Uh, if they're good or bad at their job, doesn't matter. Uh, and Dan, Stephen, I, I'm I sure, think... will tell you that it's very common that they will never do that. It's right. Because... Well, well, don't... Don't... Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Stephen, you or I, we're both in a battle for the microphone. <laughs> oh, no, no. Go, you know, I just want to know. Dan's right about something. That, but go ahead. I'll, I'll rebut afterwards. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, because I think you um, will find this absolutely so interesting. Because when I first started doing videos, and if I made a mistake in my next video, I would come back and say, okay, well, you know what? I made a mistake in that thought, so here's what I found out now. I actually had a police officer contact me. They never gave me their name, but I, they, you know, they verified that they were a police officer and asked that I never, well, I, okay, I'll put it this way. They asked that I never reveal who they were, but they contacted me and their exact words to me were, you need to stop saying you made a mistake. And I asked them, I'm like, why? I did make a mistake. I need to go and correct that. And they're like, you never apologize. You never say you made a mistake. If someone points it out, you move on and you ignore it. And I went back and forth with this person for a long time. And, and I just could not agree with what they were saying to me. And I'm like, you know, well, I, and I will still say if I'm, if, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I misunderstood, then I misunderstood. And I don't okay. see how that's a bad thing. <laughs> All right. You're, okay. Okay. No. So I, I, I just want to say I'll, I'll make it as brief as I can. I've been involved in everything Dan's saying and you're saying. I've had an IA on me a couple times. I've been in subordinate as a police officer. Everything else. This is what I'm going to say. If you're a police officer and you screw a case up, right? Like this one here. This case is is either a mistake, mistaken by several people, plural, or it's a cover up. And I believe more it's a cover up related to the project, and it was sloppy. From work in the Bay Area, which I think California has the, the best police training in the Bay Area, has an L.A. and P.D. and not, not, the, not the Valley with all the drugs, but working as a Bay Area cop in San Francisco, is that I guarantee you this would never get – everything that's happened you guys are talking about, Dan's talking about, would never get past the sergeant's desk. didn't happen, um, and, and I never saw it. I never saw any of the, the stuff we're seeing now. And saying that is that – there is a brotherhood, but I've been in situations where it's, you know what, you're called in. And you know what? You tell the truth. It's not the TV, television stuff you see because, you know what, if you tell the truth, you're going to have more people backing you than not telling the truth. It's not like 40 guys all of a sudden dish you and say, oh, you, this guy didn't, you know, if he did it, screw him. I'm sorry. Now, 40 guys aren't going to lose their pensions over one guy screwing up. I, I've been there with guys screwed up. I, screw, I crossed the police car. I didn't lie. You know, they tried to get me to lie. I wouldn't lie. And guess what? I kept my job. So, yeah, there's some things that have changed. I think Apple Valley, that's not a mistake, man. These guys covered this thing up. Nobody misses this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, it's, this thing is deep, and that's why we're doing this. Absolutely. Absolutely, guys. It's no, these guys aren't that stupid. There's, there's no way. But, the, you know, the training really blows when you get out of certain big cities and stuff. And I can see that just with the Chauvin case and all that, and I got my opinions on that. But the training in California, New York, um, out of Houston, some of the bigger departs, San Diego's pretty good. The training's pretty good, you know, and you get out a little further Midwest and everything, and it just, it, it's different. It really is, you know, and, and the rest of that. But, you know, as soon as you're connected, at the Philip Marshall, Philip Haney, David Crowley, anybody, and you know, Danny, Danny Casarello, you know, uh, you're a target, you know, and that's what happened, and they hired the wrong guys and sloppy, you know, because, listen, if they, 
wanted to, if the deep state wanted to do this and hired this as a shadows ops, but the shadows ops wanted to make it look sloppy, they would have played, they would have put, they would have, they would have put, put the tags on Mason and all these other guys they think, or we think, or whoever did this. And, and those guys would have, they'd go down. Think about that. Those guys aren't that, they're not that kind of, they have no power brokerage, you know. Their dog, their dog's not even in the fight. They don't even have a dog. So they, if they did this, they could, the deep state could turn around and say, hey, we got the guys. Why not? Let's, let's solve the case. Uh, no, this might have been, this might have been done, done uh, in a vigilante style. Maybe. Maybe. Well, that's, that's interesting. That's, that's definitely a different take on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought about it, Catherine. Yeah, I did. It's, yeah. You know, that's what they do. Look at Ollie North. Contra. All of a sudden, he's a fall guy. But you know what? And he knew what was going on, but he, he was doing his duty. Nobody really hates the guy. It's like Furman, same thing. I mean, he, he you know, whether he planned this stuff or not, you know, it's, um, everybody's pointing at him. The same thing here. They would have pointed at these guys. This was a sloppy murder. They, they would have tied these guys up and they'd be put away. Just like John, just like with, um, with McVeigh in Oklahoma. Sure got him real quick. They would get, they would get these guys real quick, too. So oh, uh, this might be... We, yeah, we might be looking at just this is, this is these guys making it to look like this because they're smart enough and there's probably attention and there's probably things they knew and there's people watching them that they say, let's take this angle and let's look at it. It's the deep state shadow ops hit, but they're just too sloppy and these guys aren't pros. That's what I'm thinking more now. And, it, and it's the other thing with this, a case like this, what I, I believe, I'm not sure about uh, the others of you, and I'm, I'm sure you probably do, but we've got multiple layers in this case. We have a Number one, we have a, a, a triple homicide, and then we have a right. cover-up almost after the fact of that. Right. In, right. In, in addition to this, at a almost a federal, state, or federal level. So there's there's many right. tentacles here. I think that there were yeah. a, a handful of, of good detectives uh, potentially on this case, but it's not going to go up. It's got to go through the chain of command. And so when you get these people that aren't going to allow it, I think even six years later, if someone was going to come out and be a whistleblower on this case to say, look, I worked in this case six years ago and I think we did some things that were wrong, I think that too would be covered up and that would not make the evening news cycle or a 60-minute segment sure. at all. That would not be allowed to air, I think, on a normal yeah, might, case, them, they, they, you know, they, 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 but This would be squashed. Something like this, I think, would be oh, sure. squashed. So they, when they, I talk they, to... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, listen. Listen, I, listen, I just talked. I, yep. Yeah, you're right. Um, I just talked to a guy in the Yosemite case whose uncle knew some stuff. Who's a correctional officer, and they threatened his pension. And I just related to this right here. Same thing. They'll threaten the guy's pension, and he's not going to say a word. Now, the when I talked to uh, Officer uh, Bowden or Broughton in this case uh, after he retired, I think William and, and uh, Stephen weren't following the case yet, but. Once I saw that he retired and he was a prominent name in this actual case, I reached out and uh, just left a phone, phone message and said, I'm uh, covering this case. I'm investigating. I see that you're off the case now and you're no longer connected to the Apple Valley Police Department. I'd like to get your, on, uh, I'd get, like to get your thoughts on some of the uh, sections of the case for a possible interview or even just s- simply meet for coffee. He responded back, yes, I'm interested in talking with you. Uh, I'd like to share. What's that? Sorry? Oh, sorry, sorry. I guess there's a, it definitely looks like there's a little lag somewhere going on. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And so when he said he'd like to call back, and then I got a call back later, he says, you know what, I ran it by uh, the, the police chief. Um, and they said I shouldn't be oh my you know, God. talking to anyone about the case. So then he never, and he said, oh please God. don't call me back. So Wow. There you go. This there is, you what, go, Dan. This is you what, know? what we're dealing with here. He, uh, uh, someone yeah. who called back to me on their own to say, I'm interested yeah. in talking about the case. I no longer work. I have no connections and I'd be willing yeah. to chat or sit down for a cup of coffee with an investigator. He was open to that. Right. And then quickly later, nope, not interested. Mm-hmm. He called his superior. Remember, he's not even working yeah. there anymore. His former yeah. superior and he squashed sure. it. That's, oh, that's, that, 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 that's how, you know what? One, that's the same as the Marines. And it's, I mean, yeah, you go back to your chief, Dan, I, I, I definitely see that, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's almost like he can't blame the guy, but yeah, he should have. I mean, you had him on the hook and he lost him. I mean, he did the right thing. You know, he goes back, I'm gonna, you know, and that's how the, that, that, that good old boys club is, is there, uh, is there forever. It really is.
Yeah, I'd be curious to know who the supervisor was that uh, kind of squashed the whole Terrible. the whole thing. But um, <laughs> at least you tried, Dan. You know. Yeah, you did. My guess yeah, would be was the e- chief. Even without getting yeah. the answer necessarily that we wanted, we got the answer. Um, we got the correct answer. The fact that it was squashed gives me more than anything I would have learned from uh, having a cup of coffee with this sure. person. Um, that told me. Oh, yeah, that told me you know what? Yeah, because he, he, wouldn't, he, wouldn't he wouldn't have said anything to you anyway. You know? I mean, really, what's he going to say to you unless it's like, you know, it's, not, it's like not a movie, but it's just getting to the right guy, and it's really tough, I, you know? Um, what what would they be scared of? What would I mean? What would a supervisor say? You know what? No, we can't. I mean, if everything is just you know, this is a, a case. We know David Crowley is guilty. What would they be scared of to talk with Dan? They're pen, they're, they're, listen, they, 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 listen they, the, the police department is like it, it's like a like, it's just like a mini CIA or something. I mean, you, you could you, I'm working a case now with a dirty cop. We think, and you know what? It's it's it, I mean. It's just it's a it's a, it's it's a, it's a brotherhood, man. I mean, go. It, you're, listen, my old my old my old, my old chief after I left became the chief. He was my training officer 30 years ago, and he became the chief. And I, he's on Facebook, and I could call him up and talk to him about something and listen to it as advice. 30 years later, because that's how it was, and I only worked for him for two years. I, I, that's how it is. It really is like that. It, it, it kind of stick. It kind of sticks with you, you know. Mm-hmm. But when you come become a PI and an advocate like with you guys, I join your club, it puts me out in left field, you know? It really does, and I'm, I'm good with that. I've been there my whole life. So it's okay. But, yeah. Well, the, the reason why I had put up this photo here, um, I know I'm having some – uh, internet issues, but um, I don't know. Uh, William, is it is it coming okay on your yeah, stream right I mean, now? Okay. Yeah, everything on my uh, lag and everything is looking pretty good. So. Okay, good, because because I may need that copy. <laughs> that yeah, on no problem. Matter how good this goes. But well, um, I mean, I'm be honest. Me... I uh, just realized I actually had the audio output off, so I'm like oh, the conversation was off. So I'm sitting like, oh no. <laughs> uh, we can we <laughs> we can work on we can, that. We can no just, problem. You know, throw yeah, I've got I've got a couple backups here, and that could be why my computer just all of a sudden decided to crash because I'm recording on two separate sources. For this <laughs> p- particular reason, in case things like this happen, these things do happen. But the reason why I have this photo up here is because, as Dan Hinnon was was saying, um, we had been trying to get the photo that they were talking about. So the photo where Detective Bone says, "Hey, we looked on." On February 19, 2015, we went through all of these photos and reviewing the photos. I could see the hole in the ceiling. Um, so I said, okay, let's let's ask them what photo that is. But you know, or were there multiple photos? This is the photo that they came back with. Now, um, first they came back with the photo of the basement photo, which I said, no, that's not the photo that I asked for. Then they came back with the photo. Um, that they that they took on February 18th, and again I said no, that's not the photo that I asked for. Uh, then COVID happened, blah blah blah. We went back and forth, um, and maybe it's, maybe about a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, they finally um, they finally were able to find a photo, and this is the photo that they sent me. This is BCA 4408, I believe, um, and the this is not an Apple Valley photo. This was a BCA photo. When I talked with the person and said, well, this, you know, so this is a BCA photo. Does, you said the AVPD has, has a photo of this. And uh, the person that I spoke to or communicated with um, said that this was not an app. This was not a BCA photo. So I'm still, I still need to get some clarification on that. But regardless, this is the one photo that they have that they say shows that there was a bullet hole on January 17th, the day that the bodies were found. Even though everybody missed it, even though nobody knew about it until Chris Klein. Without Chris Klein, they would not know about this this bullet hole. Um, but this is, is the image, that, the only image that they came back and said that shows it. And a, a, as you can see, it's photoed from a distance. Um, 
so again, I don't I don't know if we can uh, maybe get somebody to really take it. I think Catherine may have done this. She had taken a deep dive in this photo, knowing that this was the only one that we had that may even show it. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, did. I, I think you did a whole video on this, Catherine, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, um, I did a couple of them, and um, I can't remember. There's someone who's part of another group who decided that they wanted to believe David was guilty. But at a, at a time, we actually stayed up all night, literally all night, going back and forth read, um, on this, doing this photo and looking at it from every angle. They came to the conclusion believing that this was the bullet hole. My software told me it was not the bullet hole. So it's neither here nor there. We just both came to different decisions. Um, but I, I couldn't match it up at all, and it just didn't make sense. Yes, there's a light spot if you zoom real in uh, very close, but that light spot doesn't match up to where the actual hole is in the photos that were found. It's close but it's not there. But what I find interesting is the wording from Detective Bone where he states, um, uh, in viewing these photos, I could see the hole in the ceiling, which we discovered on 218. Now, did you have a hole or was it only discovered on the 18th? How can you see a hole that you didn't discover prior? If it's Correct. so obvious in this photo now, which it is not, because I dare anybody to look at this and tell me where it's at, if you did not know with the, the follow-up photos that were, you know, taken on the, on fe in February, you would not be able to point and tell me where that so-called bullet hole is, according to this photo. You can't. So I, I just find his words interesting. I, Okay, I, I worked for attorneys for a long time, and they taught me a lot of stuff. They, they really teach you how to read and listen to what people say. You listen to double negatives. You listen to full context. You listen to, you know, like in this context, I, I see a hole in the ceiling, but we discovered it on the 18th. It can be both ways. You can have a hole there, but then you only discover it later. Not right. in this type of situation. Or you're saying it's so obvious. Yeah, I think when I read this, that was proof that nobody had seen it until uh, February 18th. That sealed the deal. And, and uh, this is Dan once again. If I just to, in conclusion, I got to run here in a few minutes. I'd like to say in the three three pages, all we covered in this episode is three pages in the book. Essentially, there were two lies. One by Detective Bone, saying they knew there was a bullet hole there earlier, when that was an outright lie. The second one is Klein, saying that he was in the house with David's father. David's father says, I was never in the house with Klein. One of those two is lying. So in a matter of three pages out of this entire book, this is, I think, the best part that, that Greg did in writing this book, is that he's got a 200-page book, and there's more lies in this book and they're not made up. They're actual factual statements, quotes from people on the record that we've exposed. There's, th there's two right here in these simple three pages. Now, when this first came out about seeing the bullet hole or not, I know a lot of speculation was distraction. A lot of folks in the various uh, groups following this case said it was obstructed by the Christmas tree. I remember this coming out. They said we couldn't see it because the Christmas tree was there. And I think that was a form of distraction to get us off chasing the wrong goose here had nothing to do with the Christmas tree. They did not see it, meaning it was not even there. So uh, that, that's the first things we encountered when this whole bullet hole came up several years ago is I think the first line of defense, they said that the Christmas tree was in the way we couldn't see it. It, it, it blocked our view. And that was the type of terminology we ran into by the naysayers right away. And now here we are six years after the incident, and uh, uh, we have the proof that that bullet hole was not there the day of the crime. So interesting case here. Um, but if there are any other questions, i got to jump off here in a few minutes, guys. Thanks for your time for everybody, but um, you guys can certainly stay on longer. Thank you, Dan. Oh, thank you, Dan. Yeah, I think that will hmm. basically con conclude um, this portion of the podcast. Um, we are always going to come back here. 
um, every every month on the first of every month. Um, July first, twenty twenty one, will be the next show. We're going to talk about um, some of the details about the people that were in this house, and um, I want to thank Dan Hinnon. I want to thank everybody for joining us here. And I'm going to put William Rail on the spot right now because in preparation for our next show, he has um, he has helped create a couple slideshows here that we're gonna we're gonna end this show with. So the podcast is basically <laughs> over. This is the bonus show here. So if you're still listening, if you're still with us, thank you all. And uh, I'm gonna hand it over to William Rail, and we're going to discuss. Um, some things we're going to look at some very interesting things um first i want to um thank also Catherine and Stephen both who have done some great work on this case and uh Stephen just um are if if you're still still there Stephen i'm hoping sure. you can kind of let people know about your sure. book cuz i always forget to plug your book <laughs> and and to plug it but i i'm telling you i've now read this thing Four times. We're going to do an in-depth look into your book. So please tell people about the book that that you wrote, some of the complications. Because I'll I'll tell you, man. The more that I read your book, the more tips, the more good ideas, the more things that I see how relevant your book is to this case. There are similarities. There are parallels that are just fascinating to me. And it's just like, wow. Okay, corruption. It, you know, corruption happens, and um, you you are deep into this case. Okay, if you could just take a few minutes to tell us about the um, the book that that you've written, what the title is, where people can can get it, and kind of what the subject matter is. Because I'll tell everybody right now, it is very similar to this case in certain ways. Oh, thank you, Greg. You know, last week you read it three times, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it is uh, the. The, it's Ultimate Prey, the true story behind the Yosemite murders, sightseer murders in uh, 1999. And um, prior to that, I was, I was, you know, a police officer years before that, and then I was tied into a bounty, and I was indicted and everything else and escaped it from a setup from the same county that was involved in the Yosemite murders five years later. And I had already, you know, danced with these guys, the DA and everything, trying to uh, nail me on some stuff, and we beat it. And uh, here was the largest um, murder case in the, in the United States that year. And um, I, had a, I, had a, I had a bounty uh, that a guy bailed out, and I chased him, and he was involved. And um, I started writing about it. Yeah, and it's a, it's a fascinating book. Um, for some reason, it's not coming up on the screen here, but I'll definitely oh. add it um, later later cool. on. Thank you. And yeah. Put that in there. But, yeah, I mean – um, the price has gone up since we last checked, <laughs> so it's like an extra dollar. But it was. You know what? I, now it's at. I know. You know what? I, I, you know, I, pu I published it in 2012, and it was 2.99 on the uh, ebook, and it was 9.89 <laughs> since 2012. And uh, and you know what? I'll be honest with you. Since there's this deal with Hulu, possibly for a miniseries, a documentary, I raise the price a dollar each way because you know, I mean, great. I'm going to sell some books. Yeah, I mean, I make an extra grand a month. You don't, you don't, you know, you you write books. You're you're a great author, by the way. I mean, I'm reading some stuff right now, Greg, on your book that I didn't read. And I got I got to make. Cause I'm working all these damn PI cases, and I don't get a chance. I I, I do too much writing, but um, I, I got to pay more attention to the gray stage because. Uh, there's stuff in here that I, I should have known about that I could have probably mentioned that I think that we could nail these clowns, you know? Yeah. Really well okay. done, man. I can't believe I can't believe the information you you got on uh, from from everybody to write this book. Yeah, it was a it was a team, you know. It was a lot of people involved, and many of the people that are listening to this and you know watching this, um, they're they're all part of 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 this, of researching this case, of looking at what the facts yeah. are, talking about it. We have so many great people, and I just want to thank all of them. I know many of them want to re remain private for their own reasons, various reasons. Um, and so, you know, I just want to make sure that they recognize that we do recognize all of your help with this case. And every, every day we're getting new people that are helping with this. There's so many people that are trying to help with this case that I just, because of my personal life, because of things, I can't always reach out to them the way that I would want to. I can't keep up with them. But please, 
keep continuing to do your research on this case. The more people that we have doing their own research, doing their own private in investigations into this case, it's crazy how I see we all are pretty much coming to the same conclusion. It all comes back to the same sources and everything. So I just want to thank you all for that. And um, Stephen, definitely, I'm sure we're all, we're all, um, we're all happy sure. to have you here, to have you here as part of this. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. William Rail. Uh, let's see if I can get this up here. Um, he is the host of Strange Investigations. He's always on Twitch. Uh, well, how many, how many, um, how many episodes do you have now of this case? Twenty, twenty-seven. Oh, are you are you almost at thirty? Eight, if you include this, I think twenty-nine. <laughs> okay, like cool. That. Right on. Yeah, uh, most of them are actually a lot. Most of them will be going up to YouTube. It's just because they're so large. Um, mm -hmm. I have to kind of you know produce file size, do what I can to basically get them on YouTube, but they take for a while to basically get them up, and yeah, it's pain. But um, uh, right now, I think we're up to episode, I think, six on YouTube. Nice. I know okay. that bit shoot and rumble, like, I'll throw them up there, and they disappear. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what? what's going on here? And it's not like I'm getting a strike or anything, so I don't, I don't really know why they're not staying, especially the bit shoot. They just, they don't stay up. I, I'm not really sure what's going on with that one, but... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, this it's a uh, it's been a it's been a journey for sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, um, now I I know you had recently helped us with some of these um, conversations that I've had, and I'm hoping that you'll kind of take lead here and explain uh, what we're seeing here on the screen. Alrighty. So, uh, can I explain who these texts are from? Yes, please. Do. Okay. All right, so I'm not going to give out this number. Obviously, as you can see, they're redacted. Um, but this are these right here are text conversations, and there is much more than this. But these are the ones that directly pertain to uh, January 19th. Um, and if you read into it, I guess you can say technically through the 24th or 23rd or whatever. But um, it's between Greg Fernandez Jr. and uh, Mason Hendricks. And uh, there is definitely some really strange behavior when it comes to the text from uh, Chris Hendricks, or not Chris Hendricks, <laughs> um, but um, Mason Hendricks. Um, I mean, you know, as we discussed earlier, there's the ego. Um, the guy is very, very full of himself. I mean, as Stephen also stated, basically when you get these really loud people, they're generally involved. Um, from what my knowledge base is on this, um, I've read plenty of different cases, especially about serial killers. I'm not saying he is a serial killer. But this is somebody that wants that kind of a level of attention. They want to go and try and steer the narrative, yada, 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 basically. They just kind of they want to go and get this thing going where it needs to go to kind of keep uh, focus on it to some degree, but not on them, per se, uh, potentially. So, um, But the thing is I noticed here, as you guys can see from the title of the slide, it's who. Um, we see that there are, I think, five people listed. Um, we get uh, uh, Mason Hendricks. I... Uh, when he refers to Danny, that's Danny August Mason, Dan Jr. and Adam, um, and they are also referring to Chris Klein also being there as well. So you know, just do the math there. There's you know five people, um, and basically they talk about that 911 call, claiming that somebody had called reporting Chris Klein's plate number. This directly goes back with um, the police, uh, the police report or whatever that when basically when uh, I think it was Mc, was it Bone or McKnight that interviewed? I, I'm already sort of slipped my mind. If I wanted to say it was Bone. Greg, was it Bone or was it McKnight? Yeah, uh, that interviewed uh, Klein? Yes. Yeah, that was Bone. Okay, so Bone basically, you know, that, that's already going to kind of confirm this. Um, but then we're also getting, like, the whole thing that they didn't contact him until a month later. Well, we know when he contacted him, it was on the 19th. Um, so, or basically, maybe, yeah, it was like a month later than after that. So, I mean, it's weird because they're claiming 23rd or whatever that they were there, but you're seeing, not necessarily true. It's already kind of adding up that it's, uh, there's some lies here. Uh, he also goes on to say that he also found the bullet home um, for the, uh, uh, the ceiling bullet. Also went on to say that it also had D uh, David's DNA on the bullet, but... I mean, when I, last I checked, uh, his DNA was never confirmed on the bullet fragment itself. So, and then he also gives out quite a bit of uh, details about 
David's habits. Um, to the to me, this right here screams there's something. Um, there's a lot off of this guy. Just this, the first one over here on the left. There just is a lot off with this conversation. Um, he's yeah, and I, I just mm -hmm. I just want to stop you for just for one second, just to see if uh, Catherine, if you're still still here. I want to see it. Is this the first time that you're that you're looking at this information? Um, yes, I was sitting here reading this, going, oh, <laughs> yeah. Right, it's, it's a treasure it, trove. It says a lot, and um, just wow. The other thing I also want to mention too is you see the second one here. Um, he can't remember the date, right? That's just uh, to me that seems too much of a kind of a coincidence. Just why can't you remember the date? Well, you're remembering that, okay? Well, he's you know you're remembering all these details about, it, but you can't remember the date. Okay. But he says what? that the that the cops got it wrong. Yes, yeah, how, exactly. Why would, yeah, I was reading that going, why would he say the police most likely got it wrong if he doesn't remember? Exactly, exactly. Um, but he also goes on to say here, Chris couldn't have gone there because he had no idea how to get there. He had to meet up and follow us. Okay, so you're confirming, A, once again, Chris was there. Um, B, you're also saying that he had to follow you guys. It means there's other people that were there, and if you go back on Klein's conversation with Bone, well, now it's no longer Dan Jr., Dan Sr. It's, in fact, it's just Dan Jr. is the only connection between these conversations here. Um, so I found that a little peculiar, but also that Chris didn't know where he was going. Kind of weird. Uh, and then, of course, you go over here on the final one, and he said he was never there on his own. So also just kind of contributing to that as well. So. Right, because that would mean that um, on January 19th, mm -hmm that Mason Hendricks is saying that it, Chris, it wasn't just Chris Klein there, that there were, yeah. you know, Chris Klein was there with other people, which to me always raised the question of, okay, well, why would the 911 caller um, say that, you know, there was a report of a suspicious person and yeah. not persons? Exactly. Now, um, Hendricks doesn't know, and, and at this point, I believe, because I, I do believe this was in 2016, um, at the, you know, at this point it sounds like he knows a lot more than what I knew, so um, he's trying to get me to believe that what he's telling me is true, which I was willing to, yeah. until obviously we got some documents, and the documents did not line up, and that's when things changed. Exactly. I mean, I could see it was like you were kind of like, for the most part, kind of just like, just, okay, well, I'm going to get your side of things. Uh, I mean, definitely for the entire thing. And there's what, uh, 80, I think it was 85 or 88 pages of documents here. Um, there was like two pages, I think, one or two pages where it was Cedro that was thrown in there as well. But um, when it comes to the rest of the documentation, I mean, it's, it's a lot. And the, the guy is, he's really trying to, he's focused on trying to get you to pay attention to him the whole time. Um, I mean, there was even a couple times where he would message you a couple hours later because he didn't respond. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's just really trying to, like, hold that tension on that. So I thought it was interesting. So uh, we, can, we can definitely go on to the next slide real quick. Um, so, okay, so right here, this is where we get everything kind of connecting here. Um, you can see I've already gone left. These are the five people that were listed um, by Hendrix. Now, on this... Um, this little meme on the bottom should definitely, just definitely hold up on this one. Um, <laughs> so basically, you got right here at the top. Uh, he was there with me, Danny, uh, Dan Jr. and Adam. All of us watched Danny Mason very closely because many, uh, because of many reasons. I was the one who noticed the bullet home, and so neighbor reported Chris Klein's plate number to the pigs. Okay, so obviously he, by calling them pigs, you obviously have no respect for the, the police at that point. So obviously, I'm kind of a little. Uh, leery about uh, how he feels about the rest of it. But then he later goes on to call him the police, right? So uh, the police didn't contact him until a month later or something like this. And basically you're getting all these different kinds of things going along with it. There's multi-layers on this. It's peculiar. Um, but then he said he got a call from David's dad saying the police had found the missing bullet up in the attic. So if you go off of this, I believe that was also on, the, uh, it was on February 19th. 17 or 19th. It was one of those. It's around that area. Um, after they had contacted uh, Klein. So we're getting this, and so this is basically after that, um, at least, or at least that day. Uh, my suspicions kind of leaning more towards that day. Um, saying the police had found a missing bullet up in the attic, um, and then he had told Senior that he needed to follow up with those, that he had to go and basically get back at him because uh, 
uh, they already went in, they found it, um, and apparently, and this is what I want to go and see if we can get a FOIA for, is getting that voicemail that uh, um, Dan, or that, uh, Dan Sr. had allegedly left, based on what Hendricks is saying here. Because, once again, if we can shoot this down, this makes in this guy even more suspicious. Uh, but, once again, these texts already make him overly suspicious. Um, and the fact that he already knew David's DNA was on the bullet when they had literally just got it, that raises some questions. And my questions, I mean, I'm pointing my finger quite a bit. I'm not saying he did it, but, you know, I mean, we can we could definitely uh, point the... Yeah, he seems a little suspicious here. Um, and also, like I said, he also knew so much about the magazines and how David operated. He also claimed, I believe, in this one, uh, the full magazine you have in that picture was not the one that was used. Uh, well, that was the one at the crime scene. That was the one that was right there. So, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, that is true, because in, in the first 464 photos that, that we got, yep. they have a magazine, and that was the one that was found in the in the gun safe. Yep. Do we know what date um, the police or the investigators, the BCA, whoever it was, that the DNA, what, what's the date of the DNA findings because it must have if this is if I was talking to him in 2016 it must have been it must have been early 2016 because this is what March of 2016 around yeah. then or so May. it must I mean he must have been really on top of this as as far as getting the documents getting the all the stuff that we have now it sounds like he had that back in 2016 yeah, if he, he had, had all probably that, right then and there he was probably right, right so then the way he's know. talking when yeah, he's talking, he was in the room with these detectives. In fact, <laughs> he was there before they were there, and he was actually doing the analysis himself. I mean, that the way this correct. guy makes it sound, he's he's basically making it saying, you know, kind of sound like uh, I was in the. Uh, my my thought here is that's why I want to know more about the crime scene um, uh, company, the one that the cleaners, because they were there before the cleaners had got there. If we're going off with this had stated. So if they were there, but but if you go off of what Mason's saying, they were there during the time they would have been there. So we can basically, if we can go and check, okay, did any of them work as cleaners, as crime scene cleaners? I'm curious about that. Maybe they, Because once again, we got uh, Danny August Mason works for, he was working for some kind of a medical company um, at that time as well. So I'm Wouldn't that be curious. a conflict? Wouldn't exactly. That be a conflict of well, I mean, <laughs> but, but then again, we know that, I mean, in that same conversation, you guys also talked about another conflict about Chris Peck being in the same room with uh, Dan and, you know, all this. I mean, it's, it's one of these things like, what? <laughs> this isn't a conflict, but this this is? Okay. <laughs> so that's my thought on this. Um, and, I mean, it definitely gets worse as we go on through the slides. So. Well, he's also very curious to, you know, he's very, uh, he, he makes it clear that David's DNA was on the bullet, not yeah. David's blood. Yep. Not his blood. He didn't yep. say David's blood was on the bullet, but the DNA. And for 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 me at that time, I thought, okay, if his DNA is on there, it must be his yep. blood. Obviously, when we exactly. got the documents and I could actually look at it, thankfully they actually state that blood was not found on that bullet on item 57. If they had not stated that, I I would probably still think that, well, you know, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and if they say DNA is there, then that must mean blood. So, thankfully, they were able to um, be very detailed in that. Um, yeah, they explicitly yeah. ruled out blood. Right. Yep. Catherine, any, any thoughts on some of this new... I, I always love to hear <laughs> your, your thoughts on the new found stuff that we we're seeing kind of here for the first time, so... Um, well, um, it's it's interesting, again, it's how he's wording things. He's wording, like um, William was saying, he's wording stuff like he's in the know, but at the same time, it's almost, um, uh, what's that, distracting language as well. Like he says, all of us were wet mm -hmm. watching Danny Mason very closely, because of many reasons. Well, that's vague, open-ended, and why, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know, is he trying to throw um, Danny under the bus, or or what? I mean, if they were 
only watching him because they were afraid Danny was going to break down and lose it because this was his friend. You would state that, but how he stated it, it leaves you going, aha. So even they were now um, suspicious of Danny August Mason. At least that's how I'm reading what he's saying because, again, it's vague. It's distracting, uh, misdirecting. Uh, They're definitely um, throwing kind of some kind of an umbrella over things. They yeah, want you to focus I, on one thing. Like, here's the highlighted detail we want you to focus on. There's so much here. Um, why are we, uh, you know, suspicious of this guy? But don't pay any attention to all these uh, these details that are a little more fine-tuned. Or by little fine-tuned, I mean completely fine-tuned. Um, <laughs> you yeah, know, he, they're, they're really he, honed in. He, he never, I, you know, when I go back to the messages, <laughs> to the phone calls that I've had with Hendricks, he never had anything good to say about Danny August Mason. Yeah, I can't really remember anything that he ever said that I thought was good. It was always little things like this, little little jabs, yeah, little jabs, which is what he also did with David Crowley, though, too. If you really think about it, yep. um, yeah. And there's obviously there's a lot of people that do that. Those little jabs that they throw, and it's like, ooh, okay, well that's you know, I thought you guys were all kind of on the same side, but no. Well, throughout the text conversation, all he does is basically say, well, yeah, he was guilty, he's guilty, he is guilty. It's all he keeps saying. It's, and we also see this from um, a few other members, too. We get to see that from, uh, da- uh, from Danny August Mason. We see this from Sean Wright. Um, you know, we also see this from Joseph Seaton if we watch the, di- the documentary. I mean, so when it comes down to it, everybody just keeps saying, no, no, we're, just believe us, believe us. We know what we're talking about. We right. are his friends. You know, we would really rather see him be, you know, uh, assassinated rather than, uh, which I thought that was really weird that they said it that way, too, which is, what? Right. What? right. They, uh, wanna, <laughs> they, they want to paint the picture, but they want to interpret what the picture means to yes. me. Right. It's like, okay, paint, paint whatever picture that you guys want, but let me so interpret yeah. it. Let me look at it, and I'll interpret it the way that I want to if it's the truth. Now, if it's not the truth, then I totally get it. Obviously, you know, you don't you don't want me to try to interpret it the way that I want to. Yeah. But I mean, it's just you know, that's what a narcissist does. That's what you know. It's just it, it's it's not with with somebody who really wants you to just figure it out for yourself. If you're just letting the yep. truth speak for itself, it's really not the best uh, approach to no. that. Um, the other thing he says here about the magazines. You know, mm-hmm. and usually David always left two to four rounds of the magazines to not fully stress the springs. I mean, that's pretty interesting. I mean, how would how would he know that? And that's well, you know, I, if you I, have, go ahead, Captain. Um, I <laughs> I don't want to come to his defense here, but I had sure. made this point a, a long time ago um, about this very same thing because when I was looking at the magazines in the photos. I noticed that there are 12 capacity, but only 11 in the full one. And so I specifically asked people, does anyone know if David did not load his rounds, uh, load his magazines fully? Um, mainly because I don't know if you guys, um, if you guys have ever tried, but he is correct, man. It is, it's an SOB to try to get those last ones in, especially on the higher capacity magazines. So it makes sense to me that David would only put 11 in instead of 12 in the magazine. Yeah, sure. Because that's sure. what I would do. I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't waste my time because you spend so much time trying to fight with that sucker, trying to get it in. Um, so for me, I was kind of glad he clarified that for me because I'm mm-hmm. like, okay. So now what does that tell me about the scene? There's one ejected. So that tells me whoever pulled that gun out of the safe racked another round not knowing one was already in the chamber, and that's why that one went flying out and landed yeah. on the floor because they wanted to make sure it was loaded. Yeah. So um, to me, that what he says right there fills in so much that now more of the crime scene makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, it, it's very curious that he would say David had six mags. How would he know David had six mags there? Um, of course, six is the mm-hmm. magic number. It just happens to be the same number yep. that, you know, hey, that's yep. what happened. And exactly. us- he says he usually always left two to four, you know, rounds out of the of the magazine. To me, it was, it was too particular for somebody who didn't really know David 
that well. Even though he may say that he does, he also makes it very clear in our phone calls that, you know, he wasn't really involved that much with the Gray State Project after the 2012 trailer. You know, he would, David would contact him for questions and they would go over things like that. But that's really it. And again, it it reminds me here, he reminds me of a Judy situation. He's interjecting information that he clearly doesn't know to be true. Because to leave out, if he had six magazines, again, interesting number six, but he always left, always left out two to four rounds, but the magazines in the crime scene clearly show he left out one out of his 12. One round. In the the one, you're talking about the one in the gun safe. Correct. Right. So, which means he would have done them all the same. You don't, I mean, it's it's a habit you get into, so you load them all the same. If you have 12-round mags, you're going to put 11 in each one. If you have 8-round mags, you can put 7 in each one. Maybe 8, depending on how those springs are. But, um, yeah, so again, he's making it sound like he knows a whole lot more than what he really does, but exactly. or is it intentional distraction? Right. See, I actually, my, I'm actually going to have to play devil's advocate on this. Is I think what it is, and when I say devil's advocate, I mean just in a way, but right. I think I think this is actually more details about the crime scene than um, I don't think this is any kind of distraction. I think he basically paid very, very close attention uh, to David. Um, once again, I mean, I got a feeling there's something between. I mean, the way he talks about Kamel, I'm just going to play this way, and the rest of it. Uh, it's you have interesting. Uh, yeah, so you, you've seen the rest of the text, I'm guessing. No, I've I've heard snippets and I, I saw something where he I can't even I can't even remember. It just made me so sick what he said and I'm like going, If I was David, I had a punched her freaking lights out. And and Kamel, I mean, she had to sit there and listen to his vile little voice saying that crap to her. Well, see, I haven't his heard language. any of those conversations. That's in, um, in the book. book. That's in the book. Okay. Okay. I'll have to go and uh I'll have to go and read a little further and see if I can get those. Um but yeah, basically when it comes down to um, how he talks to him or talks in the text messages. This guy here, he seems very, very much like he is very not only just interested, but he's like really into Kamel. Um, yeah. And so I think there was definitely some kind of like urge for him. He needed you go and uh, uh, get rid of David. But at the same time, like I don't because we can basically assume Kamel was not reciprocating this um, nope. for him. So because she's not reciprocating this. I think that probably drove this narcissist here, which we know he is pretty much a textbook narcissist. Um, yeah. Once again, this is just what my opinion. He uh, calls himself. Uh, what he looks like. He 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 calls himself a a narcissist. Oh, he does. brother, yeah. you got to be kidding me! Nope. <laughs> this makes this so much worse for him. Um, he has no so, shame okay. in that, but he also says that, that David was more of a narcissist than, than he was. Yeah, kind of I'm calling you. Takes the one to, to know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, my, I my, well, see, my, my thought is, okay, now this this guy reminds me a lot of a serial killer we've all probably heard of, Ted Bundy. Uh, just saying, uh, you got a lot of the same traits. Uh, the guy likes to interject. He likes to uh, really, you know, he he thinks he is holier than thou. He thinks he is the hottest thing out there. I mean, even he's, when you, like, he's got there's it even a figure now. I mean, you, I mean, you even saw even one of the texts uh, earlier, that, or well, well, throughout the rest of it, that he basically he was like, uh, "Yeah, I'm like the most attractive guy in the in the whole documentary." It's like, what? <laughs> Why would you say that? What? What? What prompted this? Uh, he just wants to keep showing that he thinks he's so beautiful. <sighs> he's lame. Um, he's um, so lame. Well, yeah, and and, and from a p- f- oh, yeah, female. So I'm now a female. So You're from a female. A female okay. for- <laughs> <laughs> okay, shh, don't get my secret out. But um, <laughs> I am telling you, I I would be so with Kamel. It's like he is just so ew. I mean, there's no way, from my perspective anyway, that I would ever give him a second glance. And I think that was the same thing with Kamel. Kamel's a beautiful woman, and David mm-hmm. was an attractive man. And you, can, I'm sorry, but when you compare David with with Mason. Uh, uh, David wins, hands down. Oh, yeah. Well, David, the thing is with David, I mean, I don't really get, like, get into his looks or anything, but, like, if you look at just, like, personality-wise, you can tell David, you can tell right off the bat, David's not a narcissist. Right. He's proud, uh, but he's also the way he spoke, um, you know, if you look at the timeline, um, which is also in the police reports, um, you know, that he spoke, uh, he's very, very proud to be a United States combat veteran. 
uh, very, very proud of his service, but he's also not proud of what he had to do. Um, obviously, we can see with the conversations with Mikhail and all this. He, there's a reason he wanted out. Um, there's a re but there's also a reason he's, you know, he had that brotherhood in the military. So there's a lot going on with that that I thought was really fascinating because with Mason Hendricks, you got none of that. This guy is just proud because he thinks he is holier than that. He's like, like I said, he's got that kind of almost like a Ted Bundy kind of complex going on. Um, well, and along along those same lines, because Ted Bundy was highly educated, he was working on being an uh, an attorney before mm -hmm. he dropped out, and it's the same thing. I mean, Mason is not a stupid man; he's very well educated, and so I mean, yeah, he has a lot of similarities in that regard. Yeah, that's true. That, that you're pointing out. All right, let's go here. Um, just want to go maybe about 15, maybe 20 more minutes or so here on this. We'll be able to, we'll be able to finish this real quick. This, okay. this, all this slide does is it basically shows, okay, the inconsistencies on what Mason Hendricks is saying about the time and what uh, Klein had stated and also about the 911 call. It was called in on Klein. So this just shows right here, you got the police report saying 19th uh, of January. And you've got also uh, Klein admitting to 19th of January. But then you got Mason Hendricks saying, no, 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 we, we don't really know. I can't really remember the time. But, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it was definitely after the cleaners, uh, like a day or two after the cleaners, which would, that would make it 25th or 26th. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not calling. So <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe him at all. Um, you got two people against one on this one. Uh, with one actually having some evidence to back up, which is then one call. So, well, I mean, we he people. says if if he says he he was in the house with Klein, we know Klein was in the house on the 19th, yes. on January 19th, 2015. I put all of these guys there, January exactly. 19th, 2015. Now, I I do believe that they were there later. Definitely, there's no doubt that they were also there on other days too. But it wasn't just like, you know, they weren't there. The only time that we know of Klein being there is the 19th. When Klein is talking to the cops, that's the date that they're talking about, not any other date. Yeah. So Klein, I, I mean, if Klein is talking and saying all these things, I would think Klein would also mention, hey, I was also there, you know, later in these other days. Now, obviously, it's possible Klein and these guys were there uh, after February 18th, 2015, which I definitely know was, was true. That's also in, in the police reports. Uh, the same person is also telling me that. They were there. Uh, they were cleaning the house, which is weird because the house should have been cleaned by the pro professional cleaners, but they were, quote-unquote, pre-preparing the house mm -hmm. for when Kamel's sister came. Um, you guys have talked about the way that um, Hendricks was towards Kamel, there's some similarities based on my conversations with him. There's similarities with Kamel's sister. And yeah. um, the one thing, this was before Kamel's sister had gotten married to her then boyfriend. Um, but I believe it was right around that time then they got married, they had a kid, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, okay. Um, and then, of course, he mentions Judy, too, of course, yeah. you know, he's got to mention yeah. Judy, and, and I'm cool with chatting, also, Hendricks is as ridiculous as Judy with mistellings here. Yeah. This is 26, 26, 16 that we're talking about here. Yeah, he you was know. not a fan of Judy. Um, there's other texts that I didn't bring up in this one, so I was just kind of following what you wanted to go on, but mm -hmm. um, there was other, um, there was definitely other messages where he was just, I had highlighted that he really has, like, this discuss with Judy. Um, yeah, and yeah, the, the 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 reason why I thought that maybe he wasn't um, that that the cleaning hadn't started until uh, January twentieth, which when you look at the dates, you look at the times, that doesn't really make sense. It, I I don't believe that that the cleaners started on January twentieth, but he makes it clear here we were not in there before the the yep. the cleaning team was. That's what prompted me to try to figure out, okay, when did the cleaning team first get there, which we still don't have a clear answer on. And I do hope one day we can, you know, get a clear answer on. I just want to yeah. know, when, when did you guys start and when did you finish? That's it, yeah. <laughs> you know, because well, based on the, what he's saying. I believe in the it, police report they do say it was the 24th. That they finished. Yes. But they never say when the cleaning team started. 
Yeah, I think, there was some, I think there was illusion. I think is what I was finding. It was, it was really early when I found this stuff in the morning. I was like, oh, man, I was basically in zombie mode. But, you I mean, know, basically, you, would, you would have to think, you know, if the crime happened on the 17th, the guns are taken out on January 18th. Had this yeah. started on the 18th or the 19th, I would think. I don't know. I mean, but if they're in there, exactly. if, he's, if they're in there before the cleaning team, if the cleaning team doesn't get in there until the 20th and they're in there before that, that's a big problem. That's why he has to make a statement here. Yeah. Um, so even if, even if the cleaning, let's just say that the cleaning team started on January 18th. He's in there on January 19th. Yep. <laughs> There's no yep. reason to be in there on January yep. exactly. 19th. Exactly, that's period. the point. Right. Well, especially because in another text he also talks about they were cleaning and looking for clues. Mm -hmm. um, that to me, red flags. But I do think this whole thing where he's been, you know, basically saying we were not in there before the cleaning team, or uh, we were in there the day, the day or two after the cleaners. So when it comes down to that, I think that's purely distraction. He's trying to just basically cover his ass. Uh, I was not in there, you know. We or we, our group was not in there um, um, until after, you know. So. Because, yes, as you stated, yes, that they were caught basically being in there while it's still an active crime scene. Um, when they're still being looked at it, then, yes, they would be in a lot of trouble for that. So, yeah. Anything else? No, we can definitely move on to the next one. So that definitely covers it. <laughs> all right, this is the interesting one. So this is how this all plays out. And this should open anybody's eyes about this. So... You got two different opposing views here. You got there's a January 19th, which we know they were there, but you also got Mason Hendricks saying they were there after the 19th. So regardless, it's after the 19th. Um, is basically what he's claiming. So we'll, we're going to work from his text back, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, he states we were not in there before the cleaning team, and we were in there the day or two after the cleaners. Okay, <clears throat> so that's after the 19th. So then you got these other statements here. So we're going to go to the left over here, this bottom left. Uh, we went there, I want to say around the 23rd, or something because the smell was so bad still. Okay, well, cleaners, when they go into that kind of stuff, that's usually a smell they will try and take care of. Um, at least there's going to be a lot of, like, the chem bombs. They also talk about that, too, because a lot of more chem bombs to dissipate the smell by the 23rd. Once again, if they're working on, we'll say, the 20th, right, or even the 18th, that house would have most likely just, it would have, it would have had a funny smell to it, but it would not have been... Of death, and they would not have. It would not have been something in general would have probably stuck to your clothes. You could not get off. Exactly. Um, so, and then he also states this when Chris was never there alone. So now we've got one statement that comes back to this twenty third, saying, "Okay, maybe." But then that same statement also goes up towards this one we're going to get into next, which Chris was never there on his own. He was there with me, Danny, uh, Dan Jr., and Adam. Uh, all of us watched Danny Mason very closely. You know, so you guys already heard this one, and they've got the the plate number. When it comes down to it, <clears throat> now I find this funny because, well, Dan Jr. was there. Well, we got this on the 19th. Detective Bone and McKnight had met with Daniel Crowley and his kids, um, and you know, on the 19th. We once again we don't know the exact time, but we know they met on the 19th. So that would have been that same day. Okay, that's kind of interesting. So 45 minute drive. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm basically seeing this is a little interesting because especially you look at that call uh, that was put in at like I think it was like 12.30 and I mean I'm assuming these detectives are most likely in my opinion I would say they're probably still doing 9 to 5 type of thing um, it just you know just work in this case generally it's something active that where they need to actually you know, be out for an extensive amount of time necessarily but very well could be wrong on that um, but we do see that Dan Jr. is definitely in on this he was not there alone or Chris was not there alone so we got our, our team that was there and this confirms it with Hendricks as well. And that also goes back up to, um, they talk about the police. The police didn't contact until a month later or something like that. And then I got a call from David's dad saying the police had found the missing bullet up in the attic. Once again, we can basically take this right over the police report. And we've got, we've got the um, 911 call and everything stating 19th. So this already shoots it back to the 19th. We can already basically say Mason Hendricks lied. So once again, anybody seeing this, can definitely see Mason Hendricks live. Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. He he knew. He knew what time he was there. He didn't want to say it because it's uh, something he'd get in a lot of trouble for. But he did admit that he was there. So 
this is basically where they're going to leave this here. We know that Hendricks is also another liar in this uh, out of this group as well. So why do I? Why did why did uh, Chris Klein say that uh, Dan Senior was there when he wasn't? More questions, you know. And once again, if they're lying about this type of thing, my assumption, my opinion, is there's got to be some guilt for something. Were they doing something wrong? But, you know, just a kind of little tidbit to throw in there, too. This is also coming from Mason Hendricks, who also claimed that he and uh, Sean Wright had also helped write the trilogy of The Great State, and that basically at the end of it, no matter what, um, you know, that the, we the people lose in it. Well, we know that it's not necessarily we the people that lose in that one. In fact, if we're looking at a 2014 script, not really. Like, not really. So he wasn't a part of that one. He was a part of the 2013 script, and maybe, but wasn't really we the people that lost. I mean, it was, but not entirely. Sure. If, yeah, in the so. in the 2013 script, yeah, it seems like we do all lose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but in, we, we lose, but, but right. not, not entirely, because it, there's still some kind of hope that's kind of lingering there to some degree. Uh, I felt without any of that, but the, yeah. they could have definitely carried it over to more, but with the 2014 script, they leave it basically where it's... That ends. That's yep. the end of it. We know the bad guy gets taken. You know, he's exposed. So. Yep. He's taken out, and yep. the Patriots have taken over, basically. Yep. So, so. Great points, man. Yep. Yeah, this, this is great. This this visual sums it up, and, and this is where our next podcast, this is where we're going to pick up. So I'll probably need you to do the exact same thing that you did here <laughs> to start off the next podcast. Sure. This is what the next one is going to be focused on, is this stuff right here. Absolutely. Great work, William. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any any final words from anybody? Oh, just so much. And just thank you again. You know, I know this has a lot of work, so just I, I really think William deserves a huge shout-out. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if that's it then, um, we're going to go ahead and shut this down. Uh, the January 19, 2015 thing where uh, Detective Bone met with David, with Daniel Crowley at his home is very important. So I do hope to pick it up right there. There's your little cliffhanger. And until uh, next month, God bless you all. And uh, thank you all again for listening and watching the Great Stage Podcast. Yeah.